There's a crucial notion in here. Uh, in German, it's called the Begriff. Begriff simply means notion. Uh, you could call it idea. Notion is probably better. A notion of a thing is its truth. Is the concept of a thing as dynamically part of the evolution of spirit seen properly by speculative philosophy? All right. Let me clarify just briefly what that means. Normally, under most circumstances, our ideas of things, everything, the chair, our idea of democracy, my conception of myself, my conception of my, the kind of marriage I have, all of these things we conceive statically as just a something or other that doesn't change. We use the categories of understanding from Kant, okay, Verstand, to understand things. And this, he, Hegel feels, is how science understands things. You put things in little boxes. However, everything is in the process of growth and development towards greater integration. All right? The notion of a thing is not just any old idea of it. It's an idea of it from the point of view of its eventual evolution, its eventual incorporation into the whole. One way of saying all this for Hegel, the ultimate truth that any philosopher can speak is to, would be to speak the whole. Because whenever you speak of a part, a finite component, you're not telling the full truth about it. Because its truth, its notion, is dictated by its role and place in the whole. Okay. A uh, couple of more notions. Geist or spirit is being in and for itself in Hegel. That simply means the podium here is being in itself. That is, it exists. I'm being for itself because I know I exist. In other words, I can become an object for myself. I'm being in itself and I'm also being for itself. Reason, uh, the term Vernunft from Kant, as opposed to understanding or reflection, Verstan, uh, Hegel and his friends were constantly criticizing uh, Kant's notion of Verstand or understanding, and they call it mere reflection. Um, reason discovers the inner spiritual movement of each thing. You see, he's rehabilitating reason from Kant. Kant thought reason was trying to know too much, and we ought to settle for the understanding. The idealists, in particular Hegel, are trying to rehabilitate reason and say, no, Kant misunderstood. Reason is doing something much greater. Reason alone, not understanding, which is just natural science. Reason is trying to um, recognize the inner spiritual movement of each thing in, re in relation to its eventual whole. So all of this is holistic and evolutionary. Okay? Anyway, that's some background. Now Hegel's theory as a whole embodied a new theory of truth, which we ought to mention. Throughout much of the history of Western thought, uh, truth is one of those things about which you need a theory. And truth has typically meant correspondence or agreement. Namely, the word truth has typically, the most uh, famous theory of truth is the correspondence theory of truth. And it merely says, an idea in my mind or a statement I can make are true when they correspond to the state that they're describing. Okay, so if I say, my hand is on the podium, how do we know if it's true? We look and see if my hand is on the podium. It is. Therefore, the statement corresponds and is true. Now that seems obviously true, obviously valid. However, we'll discover there are many cases where the theory of uh, truth is correspondence gets into trouble. Hegel is the most famous promoter of a different theory of truth, that truth means coherence or fitting together an idea or reality into the whole. My idea of the podium for Hegel, if I describe the podium in terms of its physical characteristics, etc., this is not false, but limited, incomplete. I would, to know the full truth about it, have to describe its relationship to all other things in the ongoing evolution of God in everything, its place in that whole. Only that is its truth. This is a holistic and evolutionary view of reality. Okay, And only an ability to say that 
It doesn't mean that we can't say for now, the hand is on the podium. But it does mean that we always recognize these, this is a merely, merely at the level of understanding, not at the level of speculative reason. And we are only picking out one little finite truth, not the full truth about the podium. All right. Uh, we may take an example from the outset of the phenomenology, the most fundamental form of consciousness, my sense certainty. Now, sense certainty of the here and now may seem simple and complete. My awareness that I'm here right now, that there's a rug with me here right now. It might turn out to be simple and complete in itself, but in fact, it turns out to be incomplete and wholly abstract. And this will give you the feeling for the kind of thing Hegel is doing. Hegel says, all right, let's start with the most simple, immediate uh, recognitions of perception here and now. Okay, I'm here and I'm now. Now, what do those words mean, here and now? Well, when we examine the meanings of the words, we suddenly recognize they have no specific referent whatsoever because, in fact, they apply everywhere and every when. That is to say, I can say here and now, I can say here, anywhere. Here doesn't specifically refer to this carpet. If I step off the carpet, I can also say here. Now refers to this moment. I can say it again now. I can say it again now. What he's saying is, the concrete content which I sense is then the perceptual object it contains. The meanings of the words are abstract. Even our most concrete words have in them abstractions. This is his way of saying that we never find a immediately true reference between our terms and reality piecemeal. We only find it again in the whole. Okay? Now, this object and uh, behavior, however, cannot be understood. That is, we start with here and now, we move to say, I, I am not merely here and now, but I'm in front of an object. Now, the object can't be understood without the category of force employed by the understanding. So this perspective of sense certainty is compelled by its own limitations to progress to the level and understanding of science. All he's trying to say here is, if I try to figure out the most basic, fundamental, immediate things I can know for sure, they are by themselves incomplete and require supplementation from something more complex and more comprehensive. And that requires supplementation from something more complex and comprehensive. And so on. The understanding of anything, if we allowed it to go far enough, would drive us from the here and now all the way to having to understand the nature of God. So this movement of spirit continues from the objective consciousness of things to self-consciousness. Now let's take another brief example, and this is one of Hegel's most famous, uh, most famous little case studies. Hegel makes the important anti-Cartesian social claim that self-consciousness, my awareness of myself, who I am, can be only be achieved in relation to another self-consciousness, in being acknowledged by another. He's not the only person to say this, but he's one of the most prominent. In the ancient world, now there are historical, now he's going to make that homely little fact historically more complicated. In the ancient world, the relationship between the aristocratic lord and the bondsman, it's the slave or the indentured servant, prevented this mutual recognition. The limitations on each, because of their unequal relationship, prevent each from attaining true self-consciousness. That's his point. That is, the slave sees himself as an unfree object. The master sees himself as free, but only abstractly, and fails to recognize the sense to which he too is an object. So for example, the slave, and of course the slave suffers from this much more than the master does, the slave's selfhood is denied by failing to understand his own freedom, his higher nature. The master's selfhood is also denied because the master loses 
the physical creative act of working on things in the world, which is also part of selfhood.